This one? Don't oh, forget that all. Yeah. Ooh, but tonight, wow, tonight's gonna be really good. And uh, oh yeah, by the way, uh, if, just in case if you're watching this on this YouTube Simulcast, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and then ring that bell. Ding, ding, ding. That way you ain't missing anything. Tonight, of course, we are in the middle of our She Is series. Uh -huh. Um, literally. Bottom line, jaw dropping. Yes. Awesome. And we talked Sunday night about how Mary didn't forget the old. Right. Tonight, it's gonna be a little bit different. Talk about overcoming tough places. And for those of you that missed it this past Sunday night, let's introduce our presenter, shall we? Oh, we want to. Thank the Lord for the opportunity to have Melissa Griffith with us again tonight. You are going to enjoy this sermon, uh, Two Sticks. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, it is, it is wonderful. Just wait, Julia. You're, you're going to be amazed. And, you know, Resonate Sound has always been home of off-the-wall stuff. Yes. That ends up making the perfect sense. Yes. I mean, whether it's making firewood. Yeah. We're literally making firewood, like right there on stage. Yeah. A winner is something you, you've done previously on our program, and that was each and every sports item, whether it's a football, basketball, golf ball, or a golf club. You know, you always say, and I love what you said, you know, if you put this ball into my hands, basketball, <laughs> put this in my hands, it's Bad. only worth 15 bucks. Yeah. Put this in the hands of LeBron James or Larry Bird. Of course, you're a big Celtics fan. You know I am. If you put that into one of those hands, it'd be worth tens of millions of dollars. Yes. If you put a football in, in our hands, it's only worth ten bucks plus. If you put the same football into Tom Brady's hands, it'll be worth tens of millions of dollars. Right. If you take this club, this club will be what fifty bucks to us. But if you put this club in the hands of Tiger Woods, it'll be millions and millions and millions of dollars. Yes. Tonight we're going to be a little bit unorthodox, like we always are. <laughs> and we're going to kick it inside the water from this resonate church and our special guest, Mel Melissa Griffith, standing by. And it's like you said, what comes or what happens? when you pick up two sticks. You might want to have your pen, paper, and bobble ready. This one is going to be off the charts. <laughs> Melissa Griffith, we are set to go for this one. Thanks for joining us. We're going to kick it to you. Let's go resonate! I can't hear myself and I've already blown my voice out for the last four nights. Praise the Lord. In the book of 1 Kings, chapter 17, I'm going to be 
obedient to what the Lord told me to do tonight. And I feel like you sent me in here tonight, Pastor, with a word for you and for this church. I know you said I tore you up last night, but <laughs> I think this will be a little different tonight. First Kings chapter 17, beginning in verse 8. The Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, and get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her, and he said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in that hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not. You know what he said, brother? He said, It's going to be okay. Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. She went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he, and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. I want to preach in this house tonight a message that I have titled, Two Sticks. Would you pray with me tonight? Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for what I feel by the power of the Holy Ghost. For what you have already orchestrated, God, with the songs that have been sung, with the word that has already been spoken, that everything is going to be okay. God, you are a way maker and you are a miracle worker. Even when we cannot see it or feel it, we know and declare with our own mouth and by our own faith, God, that you are a light in a dark place. Lord, I thank you for what you will establish in our spirit in our heart and in our minds, by your word tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Living an overcoming life does not mean that you always have it easy. No one ever said that the word overcome meant easy. That is not the definition of the word overcome. Overcoming a tough place means that you've got to go through a tough place. Whether or not you like to admit it, you can look across the halls of history and you can see very clearly that difficult circumstances seem to be God's favorite platform for faith building. You can even look over your own life at some of the most difficult circumstances that you have had to walk through. And you would have to say, without a doubt, that God took the difficulty that you had to experience and caused your faith in him and what he can do to grow. Can you think back to any of those moments in your life? That time, I remember one very poignant, vivid moment in my life when I felt faith explode on the inside of me. I was in India. It was a moment after jumping illegally off of the backside of a train into a restricted area on the far eastern side of the nation of India. I was a 20-year-old new missionary. Had no idea what all of the things that I was about to get myself into. The fear and the difficulty of that moment became very very real. But 
and, and on all of the things that transpired as we jumped off of that train and got into this area with police surrounding us and rifles uh, uh, slung across the back of those policemen while we hid in the dark. It seemed absolutely impossible for God to come through in that moment. But I remember as we were standing there with policemen right in front of us who did not see us and a van pulled up and we climbed into that van and headed out toward the Bible school campus safe. I felt faith soar on the inside of me at that very moment because I knew that God had just provided a way. He was a way maker for me in that moment. And when I realized that the difficulty did not consume me, the difficulty did not cause me to lay down and die, when I realized that God was going to come through for me, I began to feel faith come alive on the inside of me. We don't like to go through difficult passages. We don't like it, Pastor. We do not like to go through the low places in order to get to the mountaintop. We don't always enjoy the climb up, but there is absolutely nothing like the view from the top of the mountain once you reach that place that God is taking you to. When you read the scenario in the Word of God, you have to remember that things absolutely were not good in the land. There was a drought in the land of Zarephath. There was a famine, and the famine had come in order for God to get the attention of his people. The famine was not personal. God was not trying to teach the widow of Zarephath a personal lesson by sending a famine to her house. The famine was regional, and then it became local, and then it affected her house, just like the pandemic was global, and then it became local, and then it began affecting your house and this house. Not that God had a personal agenda against you, but it is that things are getting bad in the land, and the Bible says that the, it rains on the just and the unjust alike. You will remember that the prophet Elijah had been provided for by God at a brook. God told him to go there to drink from that brook and he caused the ravens of the air to come and bring that man of God food to eat. The famine was not a lesson for that God brought to try to teach Elijah either, but the effects of what had come on the land were becoming very personal to that prophet. They became a point that even the prophet's brook that God had sent him to dried up. But Elijah had been experiencing God bringing food to him in the mouth of a bird. So he knew firsthand the sustaining power of God. Surely, after experiencing birds, bringing him food, his faith in what God can, would continue to do didn't waver when God spoke to him and he said, you go down to a city named Zarephath because I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain you. But here's the thing that stood out to me about this, Pastor. God knew what he was going to do. Elijah had been told about what was going on. But there was one in this story who had no idea what was going on, and that was the little widow woman. She did not know what was going on. God knew what he was going to do. He told Elijah, this is the plan. This is what I'm going to do. But the widow woman was living out the difficult circumstance part of the story. I absolutely do not believe that she knew a prophet was coming to her house. I do not believe that she knew her difficult circumstance was about to give way to one of the most incredible miracles she would ever know, not only in her life, but in her son's life, and end up being a miraculous provision for the prophet of God in the land. God had commanded it to be, but she did not know yet what part she was playing in the story. All I can tell you from my own personal experience is that what I have learned in living an overcoming life, number one, 
You cannot allow your ego or your insecurities to get in the way of how God can use you. I said you cannot let that ego which will try to rear its ugly head or the insecurities that will try to keep you bound get in the way of, of how God can use you. Sometimes we get under this illusion that if you are not doing something considered big for God, if you are not preaching, if you are not on the platform, if you are not teaching everyone's favorite class or singing the glory down, then you don't have much purpose in the kingdom. But sometimes God will call you to do seemingly insignificant things or small things, things that seem to be nothing in your eyes. The widow of Zarephath's difficult circumstances forced her into doing something that she probably considered to be nothing at all. She was worn out. Her faith was at an end. She was a woman that had burned both candles at, at both end, the candle at both ends and was practically burned up. She was not out at the gate of the city declaring to everyone, have faith in God. She was not out at the gate singing the songs of hope and joy so that everybody that passed her by would forget about their empty bellies and their parched lips from the drought. She was not out there declaring to Zarephath that a prophet of the Lord was on his way and building up faith in the heart of the people. That's not what this woman was doing at all. No, what did the man of God find her doing when he reached the gate of the city? The Bible says that she was just out there picking up sticks. Ego will tell you that because she did not know that the prophet was coming and because she was not out there ready and waiting for him that she didn't play a very significant role in the miraculous provision of God. Insecurity will tell you that because she was only out there with two sticks and a little bit of meal and a little bit of oil, that there was no way that she had enough for God to work with. Both ego and insecurities will lie to you. They are two of the biggest enemies to God's plan. God does not go out looking for the biggest and the brightest and the smartest and the best looking so that he can do a miracle. He does not call the all-knowing person the most capable. No, he equips the one that he has called. He gives them what they need to be able to fulfill what he has called them to do. You cannot use that excuse that I am nothing, I have very little, so God cannot use me. Ego and insecurity will lie to you and keep you bound up in a place where God cannot fulfill his plan in your life. The second thing I've learned in overcoming tough places is that the Word of God is directing. Yes, it is. But the Word of God will demand faith to come alive on the inside of you. It will demand faith to be born in you. Elijah comes to the city of Zarephath. He sees the widow that he knows God has directed him there for. The first thing that he asked this woman for was simple. It was a drink of water. And the Bible says that she had no problem going to find him a drink of water. She immediately went on her way. Did you notice that? Immediately she went to get the man of God a drink of water. You know why? Because that wasn't very hard for her to do. You know how it is when God asks something of you and it's not very hard for you to do it. You feel okay with obeying what he's asked you to do because it's not putting much of a demand on you to be obedient in it. But what about when that demand for your obedience changes? What about when things get really personal and your obedience is going to cost you? What about when obedience collides with that thing that we call our comfort zone? What about when your obedience to the word of the Lord that comes to your life affects your plans, but not only affects them, it changes them. You have the direction of the word of God leading you, 
where you should go, but when the demand of the Word of God is placed on you, it can suddenly take on a new weight of consequence to you that you never felt like you had to consider before. What do you do when God directs you to go speak to a perfect stranger that you have never met and tell them something? You've got the direction to do what God told you to do, but the demand placed on how comfortable you are is about to change. The widow was okay with the request by Elijah for some water. But then the demand changes. And the prophet asked her to bring him back some bread when she comes back with the water. Immediately her security is gone. Her comfort is gone. And the widow tells the man with the word of God in his belly that she does not have any bread. But as soon as she told him that she didn't have any bread, perhaps without even realizing it, without even realizing what she is doing, she begins to describe that she does have the ingredients for making bread. Have you ever done that with God? You've told him what you could not do even though he is the one that put the ingredients into your life. He already gave you the ingredients. And while you tell God what he cannot do through you, he has already put the ingredients in your hands for him to be able to put it all together and work his plan. That's what the widow did. And the demand for her faith to grow was about to become even greater. The Word of God will direct you, and I thank God that it has directed my life. It has ordered my steps. It has not returned void whenever it was sent to do what it was told to do. I'm thankful that the Word of God has directed me. But dear Lord, I stand here and say thank you, God, for causing your Word to demand that I not stay where I'm at. Cause me to grow in the places of faith, in the place of the Spirit, the Word of God directing me, but at the same time demanding from me. The Word of God will move you. It moves you from faith to faith, from fear to faith. It moves you from worry to trusting God. It'll move you from a bad attitude back to a good attitude. If you just let the Word of God talk to you, it can move an anxious heart back to the peace of God that passes all understanding. It'll be a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. And the Word of the Lord had come to Elijah, who went and did what the Word of the Lord told him to do. And he found this woman. You remember that God knew what he was doing. Elijah was in on the plan. But the widow woman, she didn't know what was going on. But she's the one that had the ingredients that God wanted to work with. I don't know if it was because of the drought and everyone had burned up all the firewood that could be found. But as this little woman was explaining to Elijah that she doesn't have any bread, and all she has are the ingredients for it. She specifically says, I have gathered two sticks, two of them. Why two? Why so specific? That's not very many sticks. But how many sticks does it take to start a fire? Perhaps she had already had a fire going in her home, like so many do in the Middle Eastern parts of the world. And the fire just needed to be stirred up and have two sticks thrown in on the fire to rekindle it. Her two sticks in our mind, it doesn't seem like enough. It seems minuscule. It seems without the ability to produce anything. How could you overcome a drought and a famine with just two sticks? But I'm here to ask you tonight, how big does your obedience level have to be for a miracle to take place? Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I will be there. I said, he said, 
where two or three are gathered in my name. I know we've heard that. We've heard it. We tout it. We say it. But that's what Jesus said. That's what the Word of God directs us to do. And then the demand for faith when two or three people get together causes a miracle to happen. She was out there gathering two sticks. It doesn't take a lot for God to do the miracle. You don't have to put on a big show to prove that God wants to work with you or through you. All you need are your two sticks and obedience. I overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of my testimony. The third thing that I have learned about overcoming is that that difficult place will refine you. It will try you. Zarephath comes from a verb which means to refine, to test. It was literally a place that was known for refining metals. To refine something means to free it from impurities and unwanted material, to improve or perfect it by polishing it. In the Bible, refining by fire was a preferable method for larger quantities of gold. Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried by the fire. In Malachi chapter 3, that prophet said, Who may abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire. You will go through your places called Zarephath, where the refining process is taking place. Pastor, that is what is happening in this house. A refining place at the place called Zarephath. The refining of your faith to shake out all of the possibilities of your faith failing. To the refining of your determination to help you press on toward Christ. I don't care if you amen me or shout me at all. The Holy Ghost sent me in here to tell you. You keep on reaching. You keep on pressing toward the prize that is ahead of you. The high calling of God came to your life man of God and you are to press on even when you feel like God all I've got in my hand are a little bit of oil and a little bit of meal and two sticks that's all I've got left I've come to tell you tonight you better continue to gather up your two sticks in that refining place two sticks doesn't feel like very much it doesn't feel like God could possibly use two sticks. And yet that is exactly where God sent the prophet to go after that woman who just had a little bit left. The widow woman thought that she was out there picking up her last two sticks. But God had another plan. You remember, God knew what he was doing. Somebody needs to hear me say that. God knows what he's doing. Somebody else may have a little bit of a clue of what is going on that God is working in you. And you are the one who is walking through the difficult place in your life. And you're having to just pick up the sticks and trust God. Overcoming is not easy. But Jesus said that you will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of your testimony. And if you love not your own life unto the death. There are a lot of times, to be very honest, we don't even want to put out the effort to pick up the two sticks, let alone pick up the two sticks and then have to hold the two sticks and then have to go put the two sticks on the fire. Oh, y'all don't have to be like that with me. I know it's true. We get to that point where we don't even want to pick them up, hold them, and take them, and even stir the fire that we've already got going. So many get burned out instead of going to look for two more sticks. But I've got news for you. Heaven is not going to quit, even if you do. When you get all upset and you say that you're going to quit, that you're not going to do it anymore, and you're not going to give it your all anymore, and you're not being appreciated, and you're not being utilized, and you're not this, and you're not that, and you've got your priorities out of whack, don't you expect heaven to go bankrupt just because you got an attitude and you got tired. God will find somebody who's still out there picking up two sticks.
and he will use them. So as I have lived for Jesus, I have determined within myself that I cannot quit, I will not quit, I won't allow myself to quit whenever famine hits the land. I'm not going to quit whenever I have to deal with the problems of the people that can't deal with their own problems and they seem overwhelming. I'm not going to let my ego get the best of me just because I think that I'm better than going out and picking up two sticks to add to the fire. No, don't you let yourself get to that point where you think that you've done so much for God that you can't even go out and pick up two more sticks and stir the fire to be able to provide for somebody else that's going through the same famine that you are having to deal with. Don't you let your ego take you to a place where God cannot use you. Yeah. I admire that woman. I never had really before, but when I got to looking at her out there picking up two sticks, she feels like she is down to nothing. I've been there. You've been there. You feel like you are, you've got nothing left to give, nothing left to offer. Life has been used up, burned up, eaten up, and she feels like the only thing that is left for her and her son to do is die. But when all you see are two sticks, an ounce of oil, and a little bit of meal, God sees provision for you, for your son, for the man of God, for the rest of the famine. In the middle of the test, if two sticks are all that I can gather, then I want two sticks in my hand. David said in Psalms, one thing, have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after. That sounds like two sticks to me. A desire for the Lord and seeking after Him. A desire for the Lord and seeking after Him. One thing have I desired, and that will I seek after. I said a desire for the Lord and seeking after Him. And if I can keep those two sticks in my hand, no matter what comes my way, if I can pick up my desire for the Lord when nothing else is going right, when I can seek after Him, when I can't find the answer to anything else, if I can pick up my desire to serve Him and seek out a place where He could use me, even if nobody else knows knows my name. If I can just be thankful to pick up my two sticks, then I know I shall live and not die. Because hey, Jesus said, those that seek him, what's going to happen? They're going to find him. Two sticks. Pick up your two sticks because if you don't if you don't gather your two sticks the next generation could die that widow woman thought that she was out there gathering her two sticks to fix her and her son's last meal but if you know the rest of the story you know that her obedience sustained their lives, not only in the family, but if you will remember later on in the story, her son died. She put him in a room and she closed the door. She probably felt like she was right back in that same place. At the end of the rope, nothing left. All I got left is two sticks in my hand. But you know what she did? She still did not lay down the two sticks. She said, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after. She saddled up a donkey, and she went seeking after that thing that she desired with two sticks still in her hands, saying, God, you gave it to me. You sustained me through it. And I've still got two sticks in my hand. And when she found the man of God, 
He came back and he went face to face with that thing, that death of on her son. And God brought him back from the dead, going out to gather your two sticks and being obedient to the demand that the word of God produced produced much greater fruit in her life than just being sustained through a drought and a famine. That refining place that she had already walked through, brother, hear me tonight, that refining fire that she had already walked through produced in her the faith to believe God to raise the next generation from the dead and that is exactly what God did after hey, after she walked through that drought of picking up her two sticks God produced the faith in her to let the next generation come to life your two sticks are important even if it feels like at this moment you are down to nothing Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hi, everyone. I'm Corbin Chris Heineken, the Dean of Arkansas Sportscasters and host of Rest Day Excel. Want to say a special thank you for listening to Amplify Jesus with us here today. No matter where you are, if you're joining us live here at Rest Day Church, whether you're joining us nationwide, courtesy of your local syndicated television stations across the country, or if you join us internationally and globally, courtesy of our YouTube simulcast. Thanks so much for resonating Jesus with us. Now, you're asking and you're saying, corporate, you know, resonate. No, you guys always bless us. But we want to turn around and bless you through the act of worship called giving. How do we do it? Let's ask. We are multiple ways, form in particular, on which you can resonate your giving. Check it out. The boy, join us live and in person here at Resonate Church at a brand new location, 3702 East Highland Drive. It is directly across the street from All Star Music in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Sundays, 10 a.m. and 5 p.m., Wednesday nights at 6 30. And we do keep in mind, things schedule subject to change. Option number two, online. That's a little tidly thing right there. Use the term Resonate Church AR. That's right. Everything right there on the screen. Resonate Church AR if you want to resonate your giving online. Just follow the directions and you can do that safely and securely. Option three, your cell phone. Look, we all got one. Might as well use it, shall we? What resonate you're giving using your cell phone? All you gotta do, text the word GIVE to that number right there on your screen. Safe, fast, secure, easy, simple to do. Option four, mail it. If you wanna mail your contribution to us, courtesy of a check or money order, please make all checks and money orders payable to Resident Church and send it to the address on your screen. Once again, if you want to Resident you're giving courtesy of a mailing option. Send your check or money order. Make all checks and money orders payable to Resonate Church and send it to that address on your screen. And those are the ways you can resonate your giving. And remember, show love, your peace, and say Jesus. Mm. That was awesome, wasn't it? <laughs> we told you our orthodox <laughs> off the wall to us from our fleshly eyes but makes 10 times more spiritual sense in the spiritual eyes. Yes. Melissa, thank you for that one. Woo! Mm. <laughs> I know we're trying to soak all this in because it's really that awesome, that, literally that awesome of a story. You know, we go through tough times in our lives, especially being in tough places. You know, overcoming a tough place means that you got to go through it. That's right. That means also in trials that we go through. You know, you, all, you and McKenna always say this, and yeah, piggyback off this. You grow through what you go through. 
Well, that's true. If you never go through anything, you're not ever going to realize what you are capable of handling. Absolutely. And, and can't grow from it. If you if you die from it or if you sit down because it's difficult, mm -hmm. you're not going to grow and learn anything from it. And I'm a firm believer that we go through things so that we can grow and establish ourselves in the Lord. And and out of that comes a ministry or a testimony to Absolutely. help the other person who may not make it through. Right. You know, so we have to be able to uh, work our way through those hard times. Uh, we may not like them. I don't like them. Mm -hmm. But I've been through a bunch of them. Oh, yeah. And, and we have to understand that there's a purpose in everything that we go through. Yes. God has a purpose. And it always comes back to how willing we are to have faith in God that even though we're going through the hardest time of our life, there is a purpose in that. We may not see it today. We may not see it tomorrow. We may just barely think we... We may think we just barely made it through it, mm -hmm. but on down the road, looking back, right? you think, oh, okay, I get it now. Mm -hmm. There was a purpose in it. it There's is. a purpose to glorify God in everything that we go through. Everything. And whew, she really hit on ego a whole lot she on did. this one. Yes. I mean, big time ego. And she literally put this, like, bluntly. Both ego and insecurity are the two biggest enemies when it comes to God's plan. Right. Well, we're insecure that we're not capable as somebody else to do what God's called us to do. Mm -hmm. Or we're not educated enough. Or we're right. not good enough because of our family background. You know what? Once you're saved, God doesn't care what family you come from. Oh, come on now. What He wants is for you to realize that because of who you are through Him, yes. you are of value to Him and that you are capable. So there's no reason to be insecure. Come on now. So what? All of us have to learn and grow. Yes. All of us make mistakes. But all of us go through hard times. Mm -hmm. But we have to understand that the reason we're going through them is to glorify the Lord. And there's a purpose in them. Now, on the other hand, go ahead. when you have ego, Ooh, oh you may be thinking mm. that you're better than everybody else. Oh, and that is never what God's intention for you was. Mm. I mean, I've seen ministers. I have seen teachers. I have seen lay members that thought they were better than somebody else because their checkbook was bigger than mine or because right. their car was better than mine. But their ego is killing the very message that God wants them to to relate to those that are around them. Mm -hmm. If you think you're all that, you're fixing to find out that you're not all of that. Absolutely. And God can't use you because your ego is in the way. Ooh. If you have an ego and you think you're the only one who can do anything, you will soon find mm -hmm. that there's that little quiet person in the back who yep. God can use who will never have an ego. Come on and now. so you have to be focused on God and what He's given you and why He's brought you through things. And because He has brought you through those oh, things, yes. it does not mean you're mightier than anybody else. It just means you had the grace of God to get through it. Absolutely. And not only did she hit, really hit on ego, she had on a word that's very, very, in my opinion, bold, direct, and directive. The Word of God, and, and please hear us on this nationally televised program. The Word of God is directive and will demand. Oh, I'm talking about oh, big caps. And now, of course, you saw it at the bottom of the screen on your lower third. The Word of God is directive and will demand faith to come alive out of you. That's right. If, he's, if He is directing your life, then He is directing you in every avenue of your life, yep. whether it's what you want or not want. Mm. And when you go through these hard times, you will have to have faith to you overcome. Got to. You cannot serve God and not have faith. Ooh. You cannot be saved without mm. faith that He came and died on the cross for us. Oh, they're real if you, if you don't believe in that, then you don't have faith. Mm. And so to have faith in God, if you can believe He can save you from the mess you came out of, mm. then why can't you believe that He can use you in a ministry or He right. can use you to witness or He can use you to support the church? You know, it's just up to you. And I think sometimes we come to God with a whole lot of excuses. Well, yes, because we're lazy and mm. we don't want it to be that way, so it can't possibly be God. 
that if you believe in God and you've asked Him to Word. direct your path mm -hmm. and you have faith that He is more than capable to direct your path, right. then you also have to have faith that He has a purpose in it. Exactly. And so we have to believe in Him. It believe. is You have to believe. There's no other way around it. You can't kind of believe. Mm -hmm. The Bible says you're either lukewarm or you're, you're either hot or you're cold. Mm -hmm. And then if you're lukewarm, He will spew you out of His mm -hmm. mouth. Well, that means you're either serving God or you're not serving God. Right. You either believe in Him or you don't believe in Him. Exactly. And so, you know, we don't always understand why, mm -hmm. but God has that purpose. And we have, to right. have, we have to believe that we are being directed by Him and that we have faith in Him to see us through whatever He's directing us through. Actually, and, you know, I, I, I spoke with Pastor um, two weeks ago. And we we did talk a little, talk, had a little bit of a discussion when it comes to faith. And I literally sat there and told him, just like, just like I'm telling you, just like I told my mom over the telephone, I've never ever experienced a faith level so high. Well, most people have that their faith level at five, and the doubt level sky high. Mine's the total opposite, and that's not quote unquote boasting and bragging on myself. That's boasting and bragging on God, because one, when you totally have that mentality, and me, I, I like that bundle life mentality. Uh, I'm a bundle life guy. I have that mindset of trust God and chill. And the reason why I have that mindset, and it applies here. A lot of people can't trust God and just chill. Right. They think he needs a hand in whatever it is he's doing. Mm -hmm. and, and when you're like that, you really don't have faith that he can take care of you. Exactly. Him. I mean, we all do it. Right. And sometimes we don't even realize that we exactly. do it. Exactly. But if you really believe in God and that he's capable of handling things for you, mm -hmm. then it's easy to turn things over to him. Now yep. I'm going to tell you something. As a mother, that's hard to do when your kid is sick. Right. As a pastor, when you can't understand why things are going the way they're going, sometimes that's a little hard to do. Mm -hmm. But there's always that foundation inside of you that's that knows God. That is the key. And that you can call upon that. In my weakness, Lord, I still believe in you. I can't see it, Lord, but I know it's going to happen. That's that rooted system that we've been discussing yes. on this program. Yes. What are you rooted in? Right. What's what's that little seed that gets planted right into you? Right. I mean, just like it's planted, just like it's planted into you, same way it's been, same way it's planted into me. Right. What's in the root system? And in this case. If you're too focused on the negative that's around you, the difficulty will overtake you. Okay, so the Bible says we're all given a measure of faith. Exactly. But the key is we're given that measure of faith, but some of us nurture it, mm -hmm. water it, cultivate it, yep. so that it grows bigger and bigger. It's not that I'm a, I'm a favorite of God's because right. my faith is so big. It's because I realized a long time ago that because of that faith that saved me right there, I can believe in God and begin to cultivate it and to grow in Him. And as I grow in Him, my faith and my belief in Him gets stronger and stronger. And out of that comes a larger faith. Yes. Not everybody can be up here all the time, Corn but mm -hmm. sometimes they start down here. Exactly. And they have to learn how it's to It's a growing process. It is a growing process. And as you grow, it's mm -hmm. easier to believe. Exactly. And as you get older, it's easier not to look around at the circumstances and think, where is God is that? You you look at it as, I know God is in that. Exactly. And it's just a matter of time before it manifests itself and I can see it. Exactly. And, you know, just speaking of manifesting yourself, you know, this one really hit home to me. Your difficult place, especially if you watch this telecast right now, your difficult place will refine you and it's going to test you. It is. But people don't like to be refined mm. because when something's refined, that means they have to go through the fire. And Very so fine. you're in a difficult place. You're in a, uh, you're being refined just like the, the, the workman that works with gold. Mm. He starts out with the gold, but there's impurities in it. And the hotter the fire, yep. the more pure that gold becomes. Exactly. You know. So that's how we are in Christ. We're going to go through things. But because we go through things, that grows our faith. 
that refines us into what God's vision for us is. You know, he doesn't, he never gives up on us, no matter how many times we fail him. But at, there will come a point when you're going to say, okay, all right, God, I'm going through this. Right. You refine me and mold me and shape me into what you want me to be. Mm-hmm. And when I'm there, Lord, I'll praise you. But you got to praise him while you're going through it too. Oh, yeah. See, see, that, see that's key to everything. Yes. Because I know Ken said it last month. Remember two months ago. Your praise is your weapon. It is your weapon. Because if you can praise God in your difficult times, and then praise Him in your good times. So that's where we get it backwards sometimes. Mm-hmm. We're gripe and, gripe and complain during our rough times. And then when God brings us out, we may acknowledge Him for just a second, but yeah. then it's like right on with our yeah, own and, Exactly. It's almost like we just praise Him for five seconds. Yes. But we'll complain for the next 30 minutes. Right. And that, see, that kind of triggers everything. That she brought out. Exactly. You have to keep your ego intact. Because you're not any better than anybody else, no matter what God's doing for you. Exactly. The the televangelist that has millions of viewers and is making big money is no better than you or I. Exactly. You know, and and I didn't say that to slant anybody. No, 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 no. You have to realize that we all have a purpose and a call in our lives. Uh What his call is, he can do because I could never do it. Right. But I have to be willing to go through what I go through to minister and to let my light shine where I am. And I can't let ego or self-doubt destroy it either way. Because Absolutely. I have to have faith. You know, even in tonight's two sticks. <laughs> that was so good. Yeah, it's, it's great. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's it, I mean, literally, if you really go back to in your own time, and not only watch this program. Well, we no, we always have everything on the screen for you. No matter no matter which translation it is, we always have everything on the screen for you, and everything's broken down. I love this point. Your two sticks, because all she needs is two sticks to start fire. That's right. Two sticks. Two sticks. And literally, she used the two sticks to start fire. Your two sticks are important, even if it feels like you're down or nothing. Hey, your two sticks could start a fire in your church that could win hundreds of souls. Mm-hmm. Your two sticks could start a fire in that spouse that doesn't go to church. Could start a fire in that child that doesn't go to church. Mm-hmm. Could. Bring that grandchild in to know who Jesus is. So never be upset that you only got two sticks or there's only just a little bit of, there's just a little bit that you can do. Mm -hmm. Be faithful with that little bit that you can do and let God have the glory for it and then see what he turns two sticks into. Exactly. I mean, it's it's, it's like that story with Elisha. No, I'm talking about two. He went from two because he was faithful with that two to four. Then you started being faithful with that four to six. Started being faithful with the six. Then to eight. Started being faithful with that eight. All it took. And all sometimes all it takes is just one. That literally wants to start a fire. All, with all they're using is two sticks. And the crazy thing is, your two sticks and starting that fire will eliminate the two the two biggest enemies to God's plan. Enemy, it's gonna be ego and securities. Let us say that to you. Be the one that has the two sticks. And don't visualize this from a physical aspect. You should lost this from a spiritual standpoint. If you feel like you've done everything you can do, then yeah. I am speaking to some people that are learning to understand of our voice. And after everything that Melissa just said, if you feel like, bottom line, that you've done all you can do, and you just want the one to tell because you think that what you've done doesn't have value to it or doesn't mean anything let me say this to you 
God sees that. He knows that. And God will honor you for that. Don't ever think that you plant that the seed that you planted was a bad seed. Especially when it comes to the kingdom of God. We all may think that we have we planted the seed a long time ago and we're all, you know, we kind of want it to be on our time for that seed to blossom. But there's a difference between us having it when we want it and being on God's time when it happens. Because if it happens on God's time, it's going to be way more than what you ever expected. You just have to remember if God gave you two sticks, He has a purpose for you and those that you can accomplish something with just those two sticks. And sometimes all it does, all it takes is planting the seed and using the two sticks that Melissa talked about. God, thank you so much for resonating your sound to us. Thank you at home for watching. Hey, ain't no service like a live wrestling service to live wrestling service. Don't stop. Why don't you join us right here, Resonate Church Info, right there on the screen. Plus, four ways you can resonate your giving. The other options at our website, resonatechurchjonesboro.com. And on the pictures, news, scoops, views, info, so much more, including breaking news. Facebook.com forward slash Resonate Church Jonesboro. And you're watching this program on our YouTube simulcast. Like this video, subscribe to that YouTube channel, and watch you ring that bell. Ding, ding, ding. That way you ain't missing anything. Woo. And we got a good one coming Sunday night. <laughs> to close out this series, and we indeed pray you, you've been enjoying this series. Because I know we've had so far. Yes. <laughs> we got one more to go right before we really get to the to the finale of our three-year anniversary. We'll see you this Sunday night for our associate pastor Pam Hovis, for our entire crew and everyone here at Resonate. I'm Chris Honigan. We say to you, show love, give peace. And resonate Jesus. 11 p.m. Eastern Time on YouTube is when our simulcast start. You'll have it on this station immediately following your late local news at 11.35 Eastern Time. We'll see you Sunday night. Good night, Canada. Good night, everyone. See you Sunday.